Awesome. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Andrew. I am the Community Wellness Manager for Champions for Health. Thank you so much for coming to this presentation. I will. I promise I don't want to be super boring, especially after a long day if you've been um, at any of uh, all the other talks. Uh, but really good information that I want to share with you all. And by no means am I an expert. This is just what's really worked so far with our work. Um, and the way that I present, as you can see, I have some tabs open. Um, I believe in not using uh, slides the entire time. So uh, I'm going to be uh, um, using these tabs here and there. And if you have any questions, please put in the chat. Please say hello. Um, I'm, I'm going to be asking for your feedback and your ideas as well, because again, I am not an expert and we're all learning together. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, do, 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 do. So introductions um, or the, the outline of the presentation, uh, I'll, I'll quickly, uh, I'll talk about who we are. Um, I'll go over what LP, LEP means. Um, I'll do a COVID-19 update uh, and I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, and then how we have worked in regards to health education, language access and providing the services to um, not just our clients, but also the county as well overall. And then I'll talk about the resources and the technology that we've used and that you could potentially use to either um, showcase your work. Uh, hopefully, um, if you're able to put it together, um, reach out for funding. And then I'll, um, again, if you have any questions throughout the entire time or uh, at any point in time, feel free to unmute yourself or use the chat function. And if I know some of you, hey, because <laughs> I know I, I know a good portion of you guys. So a little bit about me in case you do not know me. Uh, I am the Community Wellness Manager for Champions for Health. I've been with Champions for Health for about close to five years now. Uh, I'm also the membership chair for the Farm Worker Care Coalition. I'm the co-chair for the county's TB Elimination Marketing and Communication Initiative. Um, I am really big with the San Diego Immunization Coalition. And um, if you haven't heard of us in regards to the flu, uh, we are one of the county's main partners when it comes to mass vaccination clinics out in the community. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as well too. And our mission is to uh, improve community health and wellness, access to care for all and support um, our doctors, whether it's by training or if um, we give them an opportunity to give back and volunteer in some capacity. So right here, you see one of our doctors um, who's a volunteer with us. Uh, she goes out, well, pre-COVID, she would go out um, to uh, Sacramento and go lobby. Um, so we love her, she's amazing. So a bit about our programs, um, Project Access San Diego. Uh, so we do free surgeries for folks who are uninsured or uninsurable. And with that program, we also have a medical interpreter program. Uh, we have our community wellness programs, which I oversee as well. Um, we do immunizations and other type of screenings. We have our Live Well Speakers Bureau program that does free health presentations out in the community. Um, and with that program, we also became lead on COVID-19 presentations um, that are towards the community. So uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but it's been nonstop COVID ever since March. Um, and then we also have a, a, some other services that we provide for our doctors as well. So just to get it started, um, I'm assuming that most of you here, if you came to this presentation, you know a little bit uh, about LEP. So that's um, limited English proficient uh, or work with clients who would fall within this category. With our type of work, uh, the majority of our patients are limited English proficient. So we are very big in language access where um, we wanna make sure that everything that we have is translated in, in, that, in that language, um, makes sense to the target audience is, is, is really, um, and that we have our volunteers or our staff are fluent in the language as well too. So um, I'm assuming if you are with it, are you, if you came to uh, this talk, that that's something that you work with or you're passionate about as well. And just to give you uh, an idea of what this looks like in San Diego County. So uh, our work in regards to Speakers Bureau and, and our other programs, um, the majority of our work has been for um, uh, supporting folks who are fluent in Spanish or their main language is Spanish. Since COVID though, um, 
And since we became lead on COVID-19 presentations, uh, we also wanted to concentrate on the seven core languages and um, that are spoken here in San Diego County. And that's English, Spanish, Tagalog, Vietnamese, Arabic, Somali, and Mandarin. So um, really just trying to make sure that all of our presentations were translated. Um, we were reaching out to those communities and that we were working with those partners as well. Uh, the table that you see here is um, from an article from Sandag. And this is from um, the years 2013 to 2017. So while I mentioned these are the seven core languages and these are from 2020, um, and, and, this, and, and this has been from the communication from the county, uh, these are the other languages also spoken in San Diego, in, in, in our county as well too, within the past recent years. So if you work with any of these populations, um, I'm sure that, you know, really trying to make sure that we provide those services to them during this time of need has been very crucial. And just to give, give you another idea or, or a visual of what that looks like, uh, this is also from the article um, from the 2013 to 2017. Basically everything that's highlighted in dark orange um, are the communities that have high populations of LEP communities. So um, if you kind of think about it as well too, if, if you have been following COVID, a lot of these areas also are COVID-19 hotspots. So that's been a correlation too with our work following that information, that data to make sure that we are targeting those communities to provide this type of education in their language um, as, uh, um, as well as other services too. So if you work um, or provide services in, in these areas too, I'm sure that you've noticed that as well. And I wouldn't be one of the leads on COVID-19 presentations if I didn't quickly talk about COVID. Um, and as you know, uh, it is a viral infection. Um, so most of us know this as well. Uh, and symptoms, and I think this is really timely if you've been on social media lately or have been hearing the news, uh, depending on the next couple of days on how the rates turn out, um, there could be a, a state at home mandate. Um, so really making sure that you are aware of the symptoms um, or that you're able to advocate and educate your clients on the symptoms as well. I remember when we were first doing these presentations back in March, we were only telling people, watch out for fevers, watch out for a cough. Um, if it's hard to breathe, you know, it could be a symptom. Since then, we've added all of these new symptoms. Um, so really making sure that you take that to heart but also keep it, keeping in mind that it's, it's flu season, um, it's warm out there, so it could be allergies, it could be a range of things. Uh, so if you start to feel something, if you, didn't, if you think you've been exposed, um, if you can go get tested, that would be ideal. And if you don't have access or if your clients don't have access to that, they could always call 211 to go um, see their closest healthcare provider or be connected with a provider for more information as well. And this is really timely too, uh, flu versus COVID. Now that it's flu season, um, this is the main difference would be that um, as most of us know, uh, COVID is transmitted through uh, you know, our coughs, our sneezes, our droplets, right? And that is the same thing when it comes to the flu. The difference is that when it comes to COVID, it also lingers in the air. So for those of you that are working in offices, for those of you who are out in the field and not able to work from home um, and you're in an enclosed space, then you're more at risk for um, becoming infected with COVID-19. And um, the other thing here would be that being contagious, you could be contagious at least one day when it comes to the flu without showing any symptoms. Uh, when it comes to COVID, as you've heard, it's been two days uh, before you show any symptoms. And the big also thing that you should notice too is that um, you could be contagious after symptoms for 10 to 20 days with COVID versus flu, it's up to a week. So really big thing there. And one of the main reasons why, or big reasons why that we're seeing so many cases happening at the moment, I know the holidays just passed um, and it's, and people have been, you know, at home if they haven't, if they haven't been allowed to go to work. Right. So um just, I, I do want to put that out there that it is flu season. If you're able to get your flu shot, go get your flu shot. I'll talk about our flu clinics and how we've been able to make that happen. Um, but putting that out there too. And if anything that I talk about is a trigger to you, 
because uh, I know for if, if you're like me and you've been working with this nonstop and you're working with these populations, uh, I'm sure there's been a lot of anxiety and there's been a lot of just like not, I would just say anxiety and stress. Uh, I know I felt it. I personally have had family members pass from COVID, so I know it, it hits close to home. So if anything that I talk about um, kind of triggers you and you need to take a break, that's totally okay. I understand. Uh, I do want to put that out there, though, that those feelings are valid. You've gone through a long day. There's a lot of stuff happening out in, in the world right now. So if you need to take a break, take a break. So I just want to put that out there. And the last thing I'll talk about when it comes to COVID is uh, making sure that you do that um, there are resources to go get tested at the testing facilities, testing sites. If you have access to health insurance, you can call your provider. And the community clinics now have additional funding to do mobile, um, they have mobile units to go to sites and go do tests as well too. So if you work closely with the clinic, um, talk to your contact to see how you can make that happen. And if you want more information, I'm happy to um, uh, talk after this as well too, or talk offline. So now that we talked about COVID, right? Everything that you know, and then just quick updates. Uh, the new normal. Um, when all of this started, I'm sure like how you all were trying to figure out how do we reach our, our clients? Um, how do we provide that education at a distance or virtually? Um, how do we try, how do we provide our services um, from a distance as well too, while keeping ourselves safe and keeping the clients safe? And especially making sure that we're providing that education, those services in their language. All of that, we all are learning together and are still learning together. But these are the things that have worked well for us. And again, if you have any, um, any ideas or any feedback or resources that you wanna share as well, please share them out so that all of us can hopefully, meet, hopefully put them into practice for this month, into the coming month. Um, you know, we're all learning together here. So I'll, I'll talk about our health education. So as I mentioned, we became lead on COVID-19 presentations. And from the bat, it was, I want to say, at least five to 10 presentations a day. And that would be hour-long presentations, whether if I was doing the presentation, if I would, um, we partner with um, all the healthcare providers in San Diego, they volunteer their time to present as well. So it was grabbing nurses and doctors and anyone who was willing to present, um, to present as well too, and in different languages. So between March and June, we, I don't know how many presentations we did, but we educated over 8,000 San Diegans in various languages on just COVID. And mind you that we were doing um, heart health education, diabetes education, you name it, we did it. But COVID alone, it was just 8,000 San Diegans with so many presentations a day. It was nonstop. Um, but my focus, even though we were doing great work and you know trying to educate the masses, uh, I really wanted to make sure that we were hitting um, those hard hit communities. And those communities, unfortunately, often are um, folks who are LEP. You know, things needed to be translated. Things, we, we needed to find those, um, those presenters because a lot of, again, how a lot of our work was geared more towards Spanish speakers so, and Arabic speakers. And now we needed to go and reach out to um, those that spoke Tagalog, those that spoke Vietnamese and other languages. So it was a big learning curve. So the challenges that we encountered were, um, one is that the translation of material. So for those of you who um, do translations in-house, that's amazing, that's awesome. Um, but oftentimes you probably rely on your staff members who probably have other things that they need to work on, especially if you're doing presentations um, that takes a lot of their time. And what we do is that we partner with all the interpreters and translators in San Diego County. So that way we don't have um, a staff member doing all the translations. And then we also make sure that um, since they um, either are going to school or they are certified translators or interpreters that the material will be culturally competent and easy to read for the target audience. And so um, that was a big challenge because sometimes, even though a lot of our partners do volunteer their time and donate because of the need, 
uh, we, uh, a few of them were asking, you know, for payment, which I totally agree. They were in need. It's, it's hard work. Um, but we didn't have the funds to do that. Right. And a, a big part of uh, another challenge was that the presentation. So a few of the slides that you just saw, as I mentioned, things would change all the time. So trying to update and translate all the, a specific presentation all the time was extremely hard, especially for languages that um, you don't usually use and that are new to you, and especially for languages that are um, considered limited, uh, languages of limited diffusion. So basically what that means is that um, languages that are spoken by a very, very small population within the world. So those are even more in demand and those can cost a lot more as well per, per word. So, but again, our goal was to make sure that people, everyone had, had access, right? So we, we had to make that happen. Um, another challenge that we encountered that you may have encountered was that with these virtual presentations, we were learning Zoom on the fly. I'm sure you were learning Zoom on the fly or any other type of platform. But for a lot of these communities, they probably, um, they weren't comfortable with the technology uh, or they weren't tech savvy or they didn't have access to a smartphone or a computer. So we were really trying to figure out how we can make this work. Um, and then for the communities that we really, that we weren't engaging on a daily basis, we were trying to figure out what was the best way, who were, who, who were the best people to um, call? Uh, how do we work with them, especially at a time when everything was closed? Um, and now as we head into the end of the week now, right, where that might happen again, that's something that we have to consider. How are we gonna reach these populations again if everything becomes closed? Um, other things that we encountered was that for Zoom, for example, it wasn't LEP friendly. So let's say if you wanted to capture data, and you created a, reg, uh, a registration form. One, the registration was a, a barrier for a, lot of, for a lot of these folks. So asking for people to register was, you know, hopefully they could, but if they, if they didn't, you know, oh well. Um, Zoom, their registration, uh, you can't uh, have it in a different language. So the, the name, the email, and, and certain things all was in English, even though the rest was in, let's say, Spanish. So all the questions or all the fields can be in one language other than English. Um, and so that was really hard as well too, trying to figure out the best way if we wanted people to register, how to make that happen in a different platform. And again, how do we market and how do we outreach too? Um, but what we found through a lot of trial and a lot of error is that um, again, working and advocating with our language access partners, making sure that they were on board and that they understood the need, which they did because they're interpreters and they're translators, they're passionate about language. Um, one thing that was really awesome too, was that uh, if you use Zoom, uh, you may have the webinar feature. If you're not so familiar with it, let me show you. But if you use Zoom, and you pay for the webinar feature. So that is an additional fee. Uh, not too much, but it is an additional fee. So if you don't have the, um, the budget for it, you know, I know it can be hard, but this is an example here. Um, it's basically the same thing, but it gives you this option, enable language interpretation. So what that, what that means is that, let's say uh, we were in this presentation now and we had enabled this feature and let's say you were a Spanish speaker or a Vietnamese speaker, whatever it might be. And I had uh, recruited a interpreter volunteer and they were gonna be the Spanish interpreter. I would put in their email and then I would put Angli uh, English to let's say Spanish if they have it. And then I would save. And then once we do this presentation and we would start it, I would enable the interpretation um, feature so that if you wanted to listen to this presentation in a different language, then all you would need all you would need to do would be click Spanish, and everything that I would be saying, you would hear it in Spanish through the interpreter. So it's it's a, it's an amazing feature. Um, again, you need to have the webinar feature added to it. The thing about this, though, and when it comes to health education, while it's great because then you're able to engage those communities, but let's say you're providing this presentation, right? It's, it's all in English and they're able to hear it in their language, but they won't, they may not be able to actually read it. So I always made it a point when, if at, 
um, as much as possible have the presentation in their language. Um, and if all else fails, you know, then have the interpreter there as well to be simultaneous. And that's a difference too, if you're not familiar with an interpretation, there's um, consecutive and simultaneous. Simultaneous is when the interpreter will be um, interpreting in real time. As, as I speak, they speak. Consecutive is that I would speak pause and then the interpreter would um, then interpret afterwards. So it really does, um, if, if you are working with staff members and they're not trained interpreters, um, it'd be hard for them to do simultaneous, simultaneous interpreting with that feature because then there will, there will always be a lag. So um, that's something to keep in mind as well. I know that there is something in the chat. Um, it is an awesome feature. Uh, so if you have Zoom, um, a, a, you do need the webinar feature enabled. So you do need to pay for that extra feature, but it's great. Uh, again, though, if you're looking to be fully immersed and really engage that population, everything should be in the same language, inclu including the speaker, including the slides. But if that's if that's not possible, then that's a great alternative. Um, the other thing is that using technologies like Facebook Live and SurveyMonkey. So Facebook Live, we, we found that for communities that didn't feel comfortable with Zoom, um, if we put it on Facebook Live, let's say if we had this presentation or the COVID presentation on Facebook Live, then we would get a lot of engagement from that specific community because people already are familiar with Facebook. All they need to do is log on. Um, and since we could stream it live, then we could, you know, answer those questions, engage with them. Um, so that that was awesome too. A, a good example would be was was uh, when we would do, or when we were partner with uh, the refugee, the International R Rescue Committee or Refugee Committee, I think, Rescue Committee, I think. Um, and we were doing presentations in Arabic for the refugee population. They had uh, a Facebook group so that all we needed to do was log in through Facebook on their account, go through Facebook Live, and then they would be able to engage through their own Facebook group. So it wasn't open to everybody. It was very small, they felt comfortable, and they were, and they were able to ask those questions and engage. So if that's something that you haven't tried yet, um, especially with Zoom, which I'm sure by now some of you may have, but if you haven't yet, um, Facebook Live or using social media through Zoom or, or your virtual platform has been really successful in regards to at least doing health presentations or doing meetings as well too, if you aren't providing any health presentations. Um, and I mentioned SurveyMonkey because if you're looking to track that data, if you're looking to track registrations, SurveyMonkey is great because you're able to copy and paste anything that you get translated. So for example, if you're asking on the registration form their name, their zip code, if they need additional resources, all of that can be done in one language. And then you could add that link to whatever registration page you're, you're trying to make. Um, versus again, Zoom, you're not allowed to have all the fields in a different language. So things that you kind of need to consider because when it comes to SurveyMonkey, while that's an amazing feature, especially if you're trying to reach these populations, when they sign up, then it's, a, it's an additional step on your end to send them the Zoom link because they won't like, for example, if you sign up through Zoom on registration, then you get an email saying, oh, you signed up. You can download on your you know, calendar. So every monkey, you can't do that. You get the registration, but then as the owner or the admin of, that, of the registration, you need to um, do the added step of send the Zoom link to that participant or client. So it's a give and take, hopefully, um, by next year, with an, if we ask enough, um, Zoom will be more LEP friendly, but that's something that you need to take into consideration. Uh, other things that are really nice as well too, especially if you're providing health education and you're trying to make things super easy to read. Um, this is a great tool if you haven't heard of it. I always mispronounce it, but I think it's called the Flesh Kincaid. Uh, so basically what this is, is that let's say you have um, for example, let's say if I wanted to um, make sure that this was easy to read for a specific population, I can copy and paste my text and then test my, and then click this. Um, so I can put in a, a website, I can put in um, a text, I can put in whatever you might want it to be. And then I'll let you know 
um, what grade level that reading or that text is and then how you can change it. So it's a great tool if you're thinking about how can I make something high level really easy to read for my target community. Um, oftentimes the presentations that I try to do would be in the fourth grade level. Um, and if that and if it's really hard to kind of figure out what's the best thing to write or say, this is a great tool. Another tool that you can also use is um, something from the United Health Group. This is their chest plain clear glossary. So if you're in the healthcare realm or even if you're not, um, they this is a great tool if you're trying to figure out how can I talk about or say diabetes in a very easy to easy way, easy manner. Um, so for example, if I click diabetes, um, for example, on the on, on your screen, a disease that makes your blood sugar levels higher than they should be. Really easy to understand, right? Versus trying to make diabetes sound super high level, um, especially if you're trying to get that person to manage their diabetes because you know they're not, because you know they're not. So this is something that's really, really nice as well too. And they have it both in Spanish and in Portuguese. Unfortunately, they don't have it in the other languages that you may need or that we talked about. But if the majority of your clients are Spanish speaking, I would encourage you to use this tool as well. Um, so this is great. And now I wanna hear from you. Feel free to unmute yourself or just put in the chat what's worked for you in regards to health education. Um, if you are providing health education or if, you per, if you're providing marketing materials, um, I look to you for guidance. Again, I'm not the expert, but this is what, just what's worked really well in regards to at least COVID education. So um, feel free to put it in the chat if you want to. I'll wait a couple minutes. Um, and if not, I'll go to the next slide. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Um, so this is... for everybody that, and then I'll also put um, this in the chat as well in case you wanna take a look at it on your time. There you go. All right, so with that, I'll keep going because I do wanna be mindful of your time as well. Um, project Access, uh, so for those of you who do not know, uh, Project Access is our largest program. It provides free surgeries and consultations to the uninsured here in San Diego County. Um, and that's whether they are living, most or all of our clients are living at or below the poverty level um, and uh, don't qualify for Medi-Cal. And so we really rely on our doctors and our healthcare system to volunteer and give back and they have been amazing. And just, and I wanna give you a quick video as to who our clients are because they may be some of your clients too. So let me know if you can hear it. Dr. Alberto Basuto is an oncologist with Seacare Cancer Associates and has helped us serve patients diagnosed with cancer through Project Access. We see many patients without insurance and they have cancer or blood disease. It's been very difficult to see them as a consultant in the hospital. I and mean, when they come to the office, having no funding has always been, been problematic. Patients like Joel, who was diagnosed with stage 4 colorectal cancer, would not be with us today without the care and access to chemotherapy treatment Dr. Basuto provides. Muchas cosas, este, de repente, quisiera decirle muchas, muchas cosas, pero a veces no tenemos esa um, palabras tan rápidas salen, pero decirle pues que muchas gracias por lo que está haciendo, este, y no nada más yo se las digo, sino mi esposa, mis hijos, porque gracias a él, gracias a los doctores que he estado mirando, estoy con ellos. Volunteering for this. So just want to give you a quick um, video, of kind of who, who are our patients. And I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. These are probably your patients too, your clients that you see on a daily basis. And so um, if you, you know, if you have any questions about Project Access, let me know. But uh, these are these are our clients, and when it came to um, when COVID came and hit, uh, as you may have seen with your clients, services dropped. Um, if you work in the healthcare realm, um, you know patients were not were not attending their appointments. Uh, surgeries were canceled. Uh, you know everything that was that could go wrong was going wrong, and so uh, for a lot of our patients, at least. 
if they weren't receiving care or that surgery, it's life or death for a good portion of them. So we needed to figure out how can we continue this? Um, and one of the main things that we were really stressed about was making sure that we were still being able to provide uh, that language access. So for this program in particular, we have a medical interpreter program where we're able to train folks who are fluent in a different language to be medical interpreters. We also provide trainings um, through our language access partners. But as soon as you know things were starting to open up again, we, we had to figure out um, how can we do interpretation not in person? I know that hospitals may have that in phone feature, um, but we're a really, really small nonprofit and we had no idea what we were doing. We've never done remote interpreting before. Um, I know it was uh, necessary to provide uh, PPE for both our medical staff and our medical volunteers to go out into the field. We didn't have any access to that at the time. Um, we didn't know where to start. And so, and what made it even worse too was that for some of the practices that were still open, they refused to see patients because they didn't have an interpreter with them, whether that was a family member or someone on our end. So then they were turned away. So we really needed to get this figured out and get that figured out fast. And so um, we thought about Zoom. We're like, right, if we're able to do virtual presentations and have these virtual meetings, why can't we do, you know, virtual consultations through Zoom. Uh, why? Because it's really expensive. Um, in order for us, for it to be HIPAA compliant, uh, it would be an additional 200 a month, um, which as a small nonprofit, we don't have the funds for. So what we did is that we engaged one of our interns who did amazing work um, and put in the time and put in the research. And we found that through Google Workspace, um, it, it was called Google Suite, but now it's called Google Workspace. Uh, we're able to do the same thing at a super cheap rate and it is HIPAA compliant. So for example, um, through the workspace and by no means am I paid for any of these advertisements. I'm just saying that these worked out really well, uh, but through their Google Hangouts, uh, we were able to do um, same thing like we're doing now, either a virtual presentation um, or a, a virtual appointment, or we, we could at least start it, the provider can call in and then the patient can call in. So that way we're able to have that conversation um, and still be in compliance. So if you're working with those clients and you're talking about personal information, this could be a great um, option for you if you haven't had a chance to figure out how to start that, um, especially if you're, if you are providing services in a different language and the need for the interpretation is high. So this is a great um, tool for you to, for you to use. Um, and if you want more information on that, I can, I'm happy to, to talk about that. The other thing was that we needed to create the protocols on how to use this. How do we train our staff? How do we train our medical interpreters? While some were really anxious and excited to go back to the field and say, yeah, you know, I don't mind, I want to volunteer. At the same time on our end, we're like, uh, you know, we want to make sure that you're safe and that we have everything that you need to be safe. And let's actually try a remote for a little while. And unfortunately, that didn't work for all of our volunteers. And if you are in the nonprofit sector, like we are, you rely on your volunteers. And I'm sure you've lost a few of them because they may not have access to tech. So trying to see how you can engage your volunteers and play, engage your network um, and see who would be available to do this type of work and step up. Um, the other feature that I'm gonna advocate for, and again, we're, I'm not paid for this, I'm being, it's not paid for this, is Google Voice. And, um, and this is a texting feature, which is awesome because you can text your clients and you won't um, use your personal number. So this number is technically my Google number, um, if I ever used it, at least for, for, for work uh, on this stuff. But um, I can put in the client's number and I could text them um, anything that I might need to text them. Um, and I could do it on my phone. I could do it on my laptop. Um, and we saw, we have seen through our clients uh, a, a huge response, an increase in, in response rate versus calling them on the phone. Because as you can imagine with everything going on, they're probably avoiding phone calls 
um, you know, families are in the hospital, things are going wrong. So they're probably avoiding that as much as they can. But if you're able to text them and get a reply back, at least, you know, you, you'll be able to still engage your clients or your loved ones too, if you don't want to give them your number either. So, hey, just saying that, that's another option. But um, this is a great tool as well. It's called Google Voice. Uh, and you can add as many accounts as you want. Um, and I think it comes with the paid feature with Google Suite as well. So if you have multiple case managers, if you have multiple interns, whatever it might be, um, you could have multiple phone numbers so that they could all kind of engage as well too. So that's been really nice too. Um, and with that, uh, does anyone have any other resources or any ideas of what's worked for you in regards to um, client engagement, patient engagement in regards to interpretation? Um, again, that's this is what's worked for me and for us, but anything on your end? Feel free to put it in the chat. If not, it's okay. I know it's four o'clock, <laughs> so I get it. But if you have anything, feel free to put it in the chat as well too. Uh, and the last main thing I'll talk about here is providing services to these communities. And how do we do that with COVID? How do we do that with to, to make sure that we're safe, to make sure that they're safe, but to meet them where we're at? And so one example that I'll give is our immunization program. So as I mentioned, we're one of the, the leads on uh, immunizations uh, on, be, uh, on behalf of the county. So we partner with the county to receive state funded flu, for example. And then we go out into the community and provide free flu clinics. Uh, our shots are free to everyone. We don't need access to health insurance. Um, all of our materials are translated and we have um, volunteers so our nurses, our docs, whoever's volunteering, um, fluent in those languages, or at least have interpreters there to be to, to go and support. Um, so this is an example of where our clinics were um, a couple of years ago. But as COVID hit, the, the biggest thing that I was trying to figure out was how do we make this happen with COVID? How do we do our clinics out in the community? We're, we're out there, we're in front of supermarkets. We're like, how do we make that happen? So what we took into, into consideration was that everything that we needed to do needed to be in an outside location um, and needed to be in uh, when there was light outside, natural light. So I know now that we have, um, uh, now that it gets really dark at five, for example, you know, that needed to be, in, that we needed to think about that as well. Um, do we have enough PPE and supplies for our staff and our volunteers? Like all these things we needed to think about, but um, and the other thing that we need to think about too is that how um, non-touch can we be? Can any of our forms be turned into QR codes, for example, you know, or any images that they're able to take a picture of so that patients don't need to or clients don't need to actually touch anything. Your staff members don't need to actually touch anything and we could still get all the data and information that we need. Um, and, and we did that. And so we started in October uh, our, like our regular flu season. And we have been out doing community clinics out at supermarkets, school districts, um, you name it, we do it. Wherever there's a trusted site in the community, we go and advocate and try to make this happen. Um, so for example, what you see in front of you is a layout of, or a flow chart of um, a clinic that's both a walk-up and a drive-through clinic. So for example, they'll come up here via car so imagine you are in your car, uh, we'll have our medical volunteers ask the questions in your language, and then um, you won't physically sign for anything. And once you're done with the form, um, it'll go straight on your windshield and you'll go straight up to the vaccination area. The nurse there or the healthcare provider there will grab the form from the windshield. So patients, again, do not touch anything. You get your flu shot right in your car and then you're good to go. One thing that I always try to advocate too, especially when we're talking about our vulnerable populations is that not everyone has access to a car. So whenever possible, if we were, we're gonna do a drive-through, I wanna make sure that we have a walk-up area as well. And just to give you an example of what this day looked like, this is uh, the parking lot of an, uh, an elementary school in San Ysidro where it was supposed to be a five-hour clinic. I brought 
um, close to 400 doses and we ran out in three hours. And that was with both drive-through and walk up. And there was a line here and line here, you know, and part of it is making sure that people, if, especially at the walk up, right, um, that they're keeping their distance and that we're sanitizing everything. But I bring this up because, oh, and these are some, um, some ideas for consideration for sites. If you're looking on ways and how to really reach your target audience, if you haven't done so already. So I know it's a little hard to see, but basically this was another school in San Ysidro or in Ote Mesa and people would come up and get their flu shot. This is from the outside, it's hard to see, but imagine this, but for five blocks. We legit had a five to six block um, traffic of people just waiting to get their flu shot. And also this was part of a food drive too. So waiting to get food. So if you're trying to reach your target audience, you can make that happen, but you need to be innovative and think about how you can do that. So how can this work for you? Um, if you're if you're able to, if you talk to your your leads, if you're the leads, you know, are you able to, or can any of your staff members come out and table? Um, that's including with the face mask and a face shield. Hand out flyers. Ask those questions. Do those. Ask those polls. Um, you can come and pair with any of our clinics or pair with the with the food event. Uh, you know, can any of your materials be converted to a QR? For example, um, one of the goals that I have for our immunizations um, clinics is that with the questionnaire, we ask social determinants of health questions, and then that way we can connect them in real time through to 211 or the community information exchange. That way we're able to, if they say they need assistance with housing, we can do it uh, real time. Um, we can put them in the CIE in real time and make that referral. If they need house, um, help with uh, health insurance or whatever it might be, if they have access to it, we could do that in real time. Why not? If this is the only way that we can reach these clients, then we need to make it as useful, not just for us, but to them as possible because they're taking care of their families. They're thinking about work or lack of work and how they're gonna pay their bills. So if we can meet them where they're at and do it in a safe way, then why not? Um, Things that uh, we've learned <laughs> doing these clinics is that while the goal was to be as no touch as possible with QR codes, you know, we had everything in, in every language, we're just gonna make it happen. Um, we offered that as an option and people were either A, did not have a cell phone or they had a cell phone but they didn't have access to the internet on their cell phone. And so taking a picture was like, why? Um, or they were very confused about the QR codes. And so when you have a mass amount of people, you know, behind them and they're, if you're trying to take the time to do the QR code and explain that, um, sometimes it's quicker just to hand them the paper form and they actually prefer it. So that's something to take into consideration. Lessons learned, especially for these vulnerable populations. Hazards to consider weather, it, as you saw, as you heard, or you, you've seen on social media and on the news, high winds, right? Um, if, the if the weather is, has is, is hard and hazardous and we can't make this happen, um, the capacity on your end, if you have the people power to make it happen, and then also if you have the safety protocols and the PPE for your staff to make that happen. But if you're able to do it, and we can talk about best practices, there's no reason why we can't offer the flu shot, you know, access to food, access to housing, and any additional services that you are at these events where we see 150 to 500 to 800 people within a couple of hours, and then you're able to really make that impact um, in a safe way. So, uh, and one thing that I'll, I'll note as well too, because it's an ongoing thing, this model will probably, um, I've been in talks with the county, um, we're most likely gonna be um, part of the COVID-19 COVID vaccination effort. So if you ever want to host a free flu clinic and or going forward a COVID-19 vaccination clinic, um, reach out to me because my goal, again, is those hard to reach populations. And I want to make sure that everyone has access to that. Uh, and just to be mindful of your time, a few things that I want you to consider because these have been really helpful on my end. Um, use the data. Use the data to guide you. So I use Healthy Places Index. If you never heard of it, it's a great free tool where it shows you um, uh, the social determinants of health within San Diego County by zip code. So for example, 
um, if you click on it and you see all this green and blue, um, I'm gonna zoom in. Uh, everything that's in green, uh, those are areas with higher levels of social determinants of health. Um, and everything that's in blue, the lighter blue to darker blue, the darker the blue it is, the uh, less access or the less uh, rates of social, social determinants of health are within that area. So for example, if I were to click here, um, it tells me the zip code, and then it gives me all the levels of the social, of the social determinants of health. So I always look at all this, of course, because I work in healthcare, I always look at healthcare access. And within this zip code, zip, this zip code, um, only 14.6% of folks are insured. So really gives you that visual, right? Um, and you can click to by race and ethnicity, uh, really good information. Uh, one thing to note though, is that this data is from the 2010 census. So it could be a little outdated, but it's still really good information to use. And now that we did our, the 2020 census, you know, hopefully this will be updated as well. The other thing that I'm gonna advocate for is that use the, um, the resources that the county is providing you all for free in regards to COVID. So for example, if you look at the race and ethnicity um, rates for COVID, uh, let's say you do a lot of work in North Inland. Um, we can look at uh, rates and ethnicity, um, COVID rates, let's say Escondido, Fraubrook, um, Palomar, and we could see, of course, right, a good portion of the um, of the cases are within the Hispanic Latinx community, but really interestingly, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, those are on the rise, you know? So if you are working with these populations, this could be data and information that you use when you're applying for grants, when you, you know, you're trying to make, make those informed choices as to where we're gonna provide those services and why, this is the why because that's where the need is and that's where they need you. Um, this is another example, if you, if you work or live in, um, in South Bay, uh, this is what the rates are right now by race and ethnicity. So really good information too. The other thing that I'm gonna advocate for as well is uh, using Sandag. So this is a really cool tool uh, and I'll talk about GIS maps in a minute. Um, and how does, this, how does this pertain to LEP communities? One of the one of the thing is is that this is a great tool to kind of pinpoint and make your mark as to see where you're providing services and then where you're missing. So, for example, um, this is a, a free tool, it's a free uh, GIS map. And so, let's say, for example, if I want to look up at the jurisdictions here, uh, it should pop up. Ideally, we'll see. But basically, what should happen is that these will be highlighted in, in their colors. So if you provide services in El Cajon, then you could say, hey, you know, this is the jurisdiction. And if you wanna, I don't know, engage your local district, um, then you can put that information as well too and say, this is the jurisdiction in El Cajon, and this is the specific district that we are providing services in. And then you're, you, could you could probably, you know, engage with your, with, um, your uh, the assembly members or whoever it might be who's in charge of that district and say, hey, we're providing services for um, your constituents. Help us help you give us some money, hashtag give us money, right? So it's, a, it's, it's another great tool to not just support you, but help you support these L LEP communities. Um, and if you wanted to as well, if uh, you are a little savvy or just have the time to do it, it's a little hard to see here, but you can also uh, draw circles and squares and stuff and download this map too. Um, on a PDF or as a JPEG if you're trying to make an impact. Another thing that you can use is Google Maps to make your own map as to where you are providing services. So for example, um, if I would highly uh, encourage you to get an intern um, unless you have the time or someone has the time in your office to do this work. But this is just uh, a regular map from Google Maps. Um, I had an intern kind of do data between um, for, I think, over the summer, meanwhile, she was with us as to the COVID case rate um, between then and then the end of July. So basically everything in, from red to orange to yellow were higher cases. 
Um, and then from there, as I mentioned, we did presentations. I know that's a little hard to see, so I'm gonna take off the case count. Everywhere where there's a P, I'm gonna see if I could zoom in, was where we did a presentation. Um, whether that was in Spanish or English or a different language, you know, we were trying to see where have we been hitting? Where have we been engaging? Where have we been educating? And what we realized is that com our presentations compared to where we were, where the actual COVID hotspots were at the time, we had a lot of places to improve. We weren't hitting all of S um, South County. We weren't hitting um, some hotspots in East County. We were doing a lot in Central because that's probably where we were getting the majority of the requests, but where we were we really engaging the right communities. So a really good tool to use. Um, and then if you wanted to add, and it'll just get really hard to see, you know, race and ethnicity. So we can do, you know, where it's green, there are high, um, high rates, uh, high populations of Latino, Hispanic or Asian. So it's just a really good tool to use um, as you input the data and you can upload this data through um, Excel and it's not too hard, but if you wanted to do like some more work, then it, I would, I would um, encourage you to get an intern if you can. So really good work. Um, and the last thing I'll talk about just to leave time for uh, questions is engage your higher ed programs. If you are a community-based organization, or even if you're not, if you're a business, um, right now it's really hard for our students to get those clinical hours, those extern hours for their masters, for their undergrad, even those that are in nursing school or they're doing their um, a medical assistant. While usually they could do their clinical externship, so they go to a, a hospital or a clinic and they gain that experience, because of COVID, those sites are not allowing students to come in and graduations are being pushed back because they're not able to meet those hours. So schools are now expanding their scope to be able to do more work within our realm in public health or in, in making sure that we are providing services to these populations. Um, so I would use them as much as you can. And then also engineering students, for example, we partnered with UCSD School of Engineering and they're making a prototype um, app for Spanish speakers to track and manage their diabetes, but really make it easy to use. And all of that is free for us. We're not paying a cent, nothing. And they're doing all that work, one, because they, they need the hours, but two, because it's a great cause. And we're there to guide them and help them and answer those questions, make that focus group. But at the end of the day, is to help our, our community, right? So other um, partners that I look for you to engage would be our language access partners, um, our coalitions, your local coalitions, um, our local healthcare network. And we're really engaged with the network, but if you're not, reach out to me, I'm happy to be that resource. With that, I've done a lot of talking, so I'll stop. I'll look at the comments. Uh, other than that, um, if you have any other questions, if there are any questions, please let me know. Please put them in the chat. Um, anything that I could help you with in regards to language access, I'm here. Uh, we also have, um, we received a few grants, one being uh, uh, something called, it's a, a grant through the CDC to improve uh, TB education within the Asian Pacific Islander communities, specifically Vietnamese and in the Filipino communities. So if that's your population, please reach out to me because we are looking to create an advisory group um, to really make sure that we're able to engage those folks and provide that education and in the manner that I talked about, right? In a safe way, in a culturally competent way and making sure that they feel comfortable but that we're still getting the point across and we're getting that research and data. So um, if there are any questions, please let me know. It's almost five o'clock, so please go home and go relax. If you are home, um, please go relax in any way, shape or form that you do that. Other than that, uh, thank you so much for your time. And I'll share the slides and the links with everyone too as well. But if there's a specific link that you want, let me know and I'll put it in the chat too. And I'll put my, um, I think I have one more slide just to put uh, there. So I'll, I'll leave that up there in case you want to reach out to me.
And then we can do um, these COVID presentations in any language, anything that you would want. So, and any of the any of these things too. So um, we're super busy, as you can imagine, just like you guys, but we're trying to make it work. And so any way that we could work together, I'm all for. <laughs>